being an emotionally intelligent product manager. So um, before we get into the details, just a little bit about me and my story. So personally, I live in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, I have, I'm married, I have two young boys who are incredibly energetic. And uh, my oldest is seven and my youngest is four and a half. Um, from a career point of view, I graduated SUNY Binghamton. I grew up in Staten Island and then graduated SUNY Binghamton in 1997. I have a degree in math. Um, I didn't, didn't know anything about computers and really had no computer experience until my senior year of college. I took a couple math classes um, that required usage of some VT220s and VI and using Pico for email, so stuff you guys have probably never heard. Maybe, yeah, someone heard of it. So um, that was my first exposure. My first exposure to the internet was in the library. They had a big uh, sign that looked like Interstate 95, which was for the internet, and it was Mosaic, and my first exposure there. And I remember thinking like, well, who would want to sit in front of a screen all day in front of this computer? And little did I know I'd spend 20 years doing that. Um, but I got, I was lucky enough with a math degree, didn't know what I was gonna do. I interviewed with a company called Raytheon, if you guys are familiar with Raytheon, it's a defense company. I had never been to Boston, so I grew up in New York, hated the Patriots, still hate the Patriots, hate the Red Sox, still hate the Red Sox. But I moved up to Boston, I worked for Raytheon, and I started my career in QA, as a QA engineer working on advanced missile systems. So having no experience with software, it was like a great, it was grad school for me of software development. So it exposed me um, at Raytheon, it's waterfall cycle and it's, you got critical systems, so it's not like today's agile. But there it was, the process was so important. So dotting the I's and crossing the T's through requirements, design, code and test, it was a really great way to start my career. Um, from Raytheon, I was living up in Boston and I joined a couple different startups because there was this dot-com bubble and I remember, if you know the Boston area, there's the Route 128 corridor and driving to work and seeing blimps of different dot-coms and all these companies and all the buzz they were getting, which kind of now we're seeing, it reminds me of all this bit, all the cryptocurrency blockchain stuff, it all kind of is cyclical, but then it was this dot-com bubble that was growing. So I thought, hey, let me join some of these, doc, join a dot-com, see how it goes. So I joined a company you've never heard of, it was called Iwant.com, <laughs> that nobody wanted. Um, but it was sort of like a reverse eBay at the time, and it was cool going 180 degrees from Raytheon, which was crazy process, um, to then a website company where it was, you know, just you know, launch anything to the web page as soon as it's ready. Um, from there, I, uh, after that, we ran out of VC money, and then I joined a couple other startups and got into digital video and interactive television. Then the bubble burst, and I got into a company doing video chat. Um, then I moved to this area, uh, or back to this area. I worked for Nokia, which was an amazing experience. I worked on some of the first smartphones ever launched. One, uh, Nokia N95, if you've ever heard of it, was an amazing product. Um, but then, you know, Steve Jobs had to come, come around with an iPhone and, and Google and Android and kind of destroyed all that. But it was a wonderful experience in uh, product marketing, product management. So I had been doing QA for a while and I realized, you know, after finding all the bugs and finding all the design flaws, I said, how can I get involved in a career where I can, I don't have to like find the bugs, but we can fix them before the bugs even happen. And that's what got me from QA into product. After Nokia, I joined a company called Gartner, which is an IT research company, also worked on a video portal for them. And now, currently for the last year and a half, I work for a company called Aclaro. And we're based in Irvington, we have an office in Boston, office in San Francisco, um, and an office in Thailand. And we, are, we do translation and localization services. So if you have a website or you have marketing content and you need it from one language into 50 languages, we have freelance translators, we help you do that, and I've managed a platform, uh, we've built a, a portal and an API that allows content owners to submit orders to us. We then receive the content and send it back to them. So that's what, kind of what my career trajectory has been, how I've gotten into product and the different experiences. So 
when um, the product school reached out to me and, and talk, we, we were talking about me giving a presentation, I went through the product school's suite of, of the meetups that I saw. I was like incredibly impressed with all this amazing content. And what I realized was like, I, I like can't compete with all this amazing product management stuff. So what I was thinking is, what could I present about that actually I'm not really good at? Or things, or an area that I could be so much better and that was emotional intelligence. All right, so in essence, the way I view it is emotional intelligence is being aware of not just your emotions, but also other people's emotions. And how many of you are in product management right now? And how many of you obviously aspire to be in product management? Okay, so when you're getting into product management, and this is really any field, you just gotta, there's gonna be tons of highs and lows. So, and I listed these cliches here, which is, these are things that I've heard throughout my career, and I think these span outside of just product management. And the thing that, that ties these cliches, I feel that if someone says these things to you, they might be triggering something that's a, an indicator of an emotional response that they're getting from you, or an emotional feel. So, um, high level, you know, I think you've heard these before, don't get too high, don't get too low, don't accept status quo. You guys know what KISS is, right? Everyone knows KISS, keep it simple, stupid. So don't over-engineer things when you get into product. Um, don't take product failures personally. Be a good loser and be an e even better winner. So high level, I didn't want to put these up here because they're negative anyway. I think they're wonderful advice. But for me, when you hear these things, just my advice to you is keep a trigger. It's like, oh, if someone's saying that to me, are they feeling a certain way? Are they, you know, based upon the, an emotional response that I'm giving? So again, it's all about being aware. So next step of the, of the talk is to get into, I thought it might be good to talk about emotional intelligence in the realm of a product life cycle. So, every product, you, you've just become a new product manager at your company or at a new company, how do you think you're gonna feel? Right, so you're gonna be inquisitive through the moon. So everything, if you take on this new job in product, you're gonna be asking why about everything. Why does it work this way? Why doesn't it work another way? Why? Haven't you done this before? And how can we make this better? So, so you're gonna have tons and tons of questions. You may be confident, I I'm ready for this job, I've got the skill set, or maybe you won't. Maybe you'll get in there and say, what have I gotten myself into? I'm confused. But no matter what, you're gonna be eager to impress everyone around you. And so that's how you're gonna be feeling. But, but the thing that's not so obvious is how are others gonna be feeling when you start a new project, when you're the new, the new sheriff in town, the new product lead, how is that gonna, is everyone at that company gonna be rah-rah for you? Or, or are you taking over a product that maybe was failing and then somebody else isn't gonna be so excited? Or are you coming in with all your new ideas and all your ways of making things better but there are certain people who are kind of set in their ways and comfortable? Not everyone is going to be so accepting of the changes that you're gonna to wanna to bring out because you're, you're gonna have all this energy and all this excitement. Um, when I joined that dot com, I want dot com, I, had, I was one of the first employees, but they had already done their like two month, 70, 80 hour weeks to launch the first version of their website. So they got the website out and then they brought me on. And I was super excited to be at this dot com and I had all this QA, QA mindset of like, I'm gonna find every bug. I can look under every single web, you know, every web page and find all the bugs in the software. So I spent, same thing, I did 70, 80 hour weeks, my first like two weeks on the job, finding every broken link, every, every, uh, every 404 page, everything that was wrong with the website. And I built this huge list of errors and I was like, I can't believe how excited everyone's gonna be when I send this huge list of everything, <laughs> everything that's completely wrong that needs to be fixed. So I emailed it out and I was ready to impress and I was so excited and some of the developers there were pumped. They were like, this is awesome, we're gonna get right into the code and start fixing everything that you found. 
But only later after like, you know, a couple months down the road, I was with an, one of the developers and we had become friendly and gotten to know each other. And, you know, we had a couple of drinks and he was like, I thought you were such a jerk <laughs> when you started the company because he, when he saw all the bugs, he was like, why are you ripping our product to shreds? Instead of talking about all the good things, all you're doing is talking about what's wrong. And I didn't think about that when I sent that list. So, you know, think about that. When you get in a new job and you're, as a, and on the product side, your job is to figure out what's wrong, what can we improve, what can we make better. So, yeah, you're going to have to indicate things that are wrong with the product, but just be weary, like, there might be other people who, it's their baby, that you're, you know, you never want to tell anyone their baby isn't pretty. So, um, just keep that in mind is my advice. Be a bull in the china shop. Like, you can't make an omelet without cracking some eggs, but crack them really carefully. So just tiptoe through that china shop. Be the bull, you know, be a change maker, but just think about, okay, like, if I break all the, these glasses over here, what's going to be the impact? How's everyone going to feel? So just keep that in mind. All right, next phase. You've been working a couple of weeks or a couple of months. You've completed the first sprint. You're ready to do your launch. You're ready for your MVP. Everybody knows MVP? Anyone don't know MVP? Okay, so you're ready for that minimum viable product. You, how are you feeling again? How are you feeling about that first launch? You're excited, you're nervous, you're, you're, it's totally human that you're gonna be looking for praise. I just busted my hump. I, I mean, you put in all these nights and all these days, you've worked so hard, you've aggregated requirements, you've talked to sales, you've talked to marketing, you've talked to customers, you've uh, done usability studies and focus groups, then you've worked with the, develop the designers and the developers, they've launched the product, or you know, they're ready to, for that first launch, but again, all eyes are on you, and you have to think about how is everybody else, so when you're at that launch meeting, like how is everybody else feeling in the room? Are there gonna be certain people in the room that don't want that launch to succeed, that they don't want this rocket to take off, they want it to burst in flames? So should you be mad at them? No, I think you gotta put yourselves in their shoes, be the leader, but be subtle about it. So I think when there's a launch and you're so excited about it, you could get caught up and I've done this before. When you get caught up and it ends up being about you and your product and your launch, don't do that. Because you risk alienating other folks and you wouldn't, you'd be nowhere without the rest of your team. If you don't have designers and developers and support staff and sales and marketing, you have nothing. So unless you're an individual entrepreneur doing it all. So get, when you're, you know, bring everyone together Make sure everyone is involved. So there's this, um, have you guys heard of go-to-market programs, GTM programs? So Nokia was huge on them. It was really good. And what, what GTM is all about is it's not only about the product. Just because the product, uh, the code works, doesn't mean you're going to be successful. You have to bring sales, marketing, support, legal, finance, HR, bring them all together. Make them feel like they're all part of the team that's launching this product. And then when you need marketing to go the extra mile and do some extra campaigns for you and really help you with SEO, and you need sales to really do the legwork, they're gonna to wanna to do that because it's all a team doing a launch, not you, the product manager, just launching your product. Um, but will, what, what, what will happen, as much as I hope it doesn't, but I know it will, is if you're getting into product or any, anything, you're gonna face failures in your career. So you're gonna be so excited, you're gonna launch a product and no one's gonna to wanna to use it. Or you're gonna have this launch, you launch the product and uh, 10 minutes after you launch, there's some monster error with it and the whole thing is blowing up. So again, same advice, all eyes are on you. So when that major failure happens, how are you gonna react? How, how are you gonna make sure, like take a deep breath and think about Okay, everyone's focused on me. Are you gonna stop pointing fingers? Are you gonna start blaming? Oh, you didn't have any sales. Oh, sa you, know, you don't have any customers. Sa sales messed up. Sales didn't do what they were supposed to do. Marketing didn't send those emails. Marketing didn't, didn't do a good SEO campaign. That's not what you wanna do. Don't be the stressed out, like kind of crazy lunatic. Like, 
take it all, digest it. If you need to walk away for a little bit, walk away. Deal with your kind of emotions and know that you're going to be the leader. So when you come back after that failure, it's glass half full, not glass half empty. Handling success. So now is a, this is the fun part, right? So you've launched, everything is going wonderfully, you're energized, you're proud. Again, very, it kind of comes back to the same advice again. Don't make it about you. So make sure the whole team celebrates. And that's another thing I haven't done well in my career is sometimes in product, you're so passionate and you're so eager, you're, you're always jumping to the next thing that, how can I make it even better and better and better and better? That sometimes you don't sit back and just take it in and say, hey, this just worked. And I, I'm, I'm not sure about everybody here, but the reason why I love product and why I want to come here and give back to you is because I've gotten so much from, from being in product management in that it, there's no better feeling from a career perspective than for me at least when someone comes up and says, I used your product and I had a great experience, or your product made my life better for this reason, or made my work a little easier to do. And when someone says, hey, and, and when they see something that's not working and they complain about it, and then you can ease that complaint, or ease that complaint, that's really special. Um, and wins are really special. So when you do get a win, you know, make sure you appreciate it and share that with the team. Some of the best coaches say when the team lose, they stand in front of a podium after a press conference, after a big game, and when they lose, they say, it's on me, or it's on, it's on us, the coaches, we failed. But when they win, it was the team. The team did it, I had nothing, I, you know, it was, I had nothing to do with it, it was, all, it was all the team. And in product, you gotta be prepared for that too. So make sure when you do win, it's a team celebration, and share those, share those moments. Make sure, send, you know, do the individual thank yous. Some, sometimes there's another mistake I've made that I've hopefully learned from. Whether it was something that went wrong or something went good, sometimes I would just aggregate a big email and send to everyone. And, and that's okay to do because, then it, it, you know, but the, the individual thanks sometimes will, will get you much further. So, Take your developer and developers out to lunch. Take your designers out to dinner. You know, go to the sales meetings and, and give a big thank you in that sales meeting. So make sure that you're always appreciative because again, standing alone, like you're not doing the coding. You're not doing the designing. You're, like, you're not doing the, the legwork of the selling. Maybe you're doing sales support and, and tech support, but for you to be successful, you need everyone around you to be successful, and you're gonna need them to go the extra mile for you when times are tough. When it's a Saturday night, and the site is down, and you need everyone to rally and get it back up. So these moments when you can celebrate the wins, these are the times that people, people will remember, and they'll be there. They'll have your back when you need them. All right, so that's kind of the uh, emotional, intelligent part of the presentation. Um, but I also had, I, in my mind, I was just thinking, well, well, what tips, what are like the number one tips I could give to you guys, just more tactically speaking, for those of you in product or wanting to get into product or in software development of any sort. So, you come up with an idea, you want to go build something, you, you need your designer, you need your developer, don't just tell them what to do. Why is it important for them to do it? Make sure you always package that. Always explain to them, this is why it's important to the business. This is why I'm asking you to do this work. Because it's go they're gonna come into different forks in the road as they're doing their development. And if they know the bigger long-term picture, they're gonna make smarter decisions. So, so you're going to get really busy. Sales is going to be hounding you, and marketing is going to be hounding you, and you might feel like, oh, I don't have time. I just need you to, you know, just send an email, uh, Mr. Developer, Mrs. Developer, please do this. But you don't give them that picture. So you can really get caught up in the nitty-gritty of an agile sprint. You know, you break every little task down, you put it in Jira, you put it wherever, and then you're going to just be handing out tasks. 
But just remember, always keep that big picture. And that's what, that's what your job is. That's why you're the product person. Because you need to have that big picture and you don't want to keep that information just to yourself. Um, all right, now I, I mentioned JIRA. So now it comes to, to methodologies and tools. So um, in, in a methodology standpoint, you're going to hear about whether it's Agile, Scrum, Kanban, Waterfall. You know, you're going to hear all of these things. And, and uh, this is just my two cents on it, is I think they all have advantages and they all have disadvantages. And what you should do is evaluate them all and decide which work best for you and your team. So some of these, like if you take a Scrum class or go take a Scrum certificate, they say, it's not Scrum unless you follow all these steps entirely 100%. And I disagree with that. I think you can take elements of stand-up meetings and elements of agile releases, and you can massage that to work for you and your team. So whether it's two weeks or three week sprints or one month sprints or two month whatever, just figure out kind of between you and your team, because if everyone is in, Make sure you get buy-in on the process. That's more important than buy-in on the tool. But speak, and speaking of tools, so now you're, you'll, you'll be in product and you're gonna get emails about this uh, roadmap tool or this prototyping tool and this. Again, the tools aren't gonna give you what you need. There's no tool that's gonna be the magic bullet that's gonna make you successful. It's not about the tool, it's gonna to be about the business requirements and it's about how you behave as a product manager and how you rally the team and how you uh, simplify problems and go to market with things that your customers are gonna find useful. That's what's gonna make you successful, not the tool. Um, and I think with the tools too, like again, all these tools have pros and cons, evaluate them, get buy-in. Um, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge golfer, I'll golf once a year or so, but there's a saying that like, uh, and my clubs are just ancient, old, but there's a saying like a good golfer just needs like two clubs and they could actually just go golf 18 holes. That's how, and with product management, I just wanted to say, I, there's two tools that for me, I think I could pretty much kind of be a product manager for anything with two, any digital product with two tools and I just want to call them out. One is Snagit. I don't know if you guys ever use Snagit, it's for screenshotting and for video recording. So instead of telling someone, hey, on the top left there's a button on this website, you can just take a screenshot, put a big arrow to it. So there's also Chrome plugins that do things like that and other products. But Snagit I really like and Bugzilla for just listing requirements. It's open source and for tracking bugs and such. All right, a, a, a shout out to my, where I started in my career, going backwards a little bit. As a product manager, again, you're the CEO. You're responsible for the ultimate success of the product, so you better put your testing hat on. I don't think you can just say, oh, there was a bug, I blame QA. Don't do that. Like, you need to understand the methodologies of QA because when it's time to test, you should help out. And if you spot the bug before QA, great. Tell QA how you did it. Give them the reproducible steps. Have them add it to their test cases. But don't be in the, oh, you know, it's, it's their fault, they didn't do enough testing, that's why we had bugs. That's not what you want to do. Um, because you're going to need QA to have your back. So, when you are doing QA, mindset, constructive destruction. So, you're going to be so excited, you want to show off this new feature of whatever, there's a field of enter your name here. Make sure, max out the characters, put in numbers, put in uh, scripting code, like, try to break your product before people out in the real world break it. You, you might still launch anyway, but at least you'll know about it. Um, and last but not least, never push on a Friday because you'll ruin your weekend. Um, all right, with that, that's my presentation. So. Uh, Q&A, go for it. Well, what kind of advice since you've been on, on your side of it for when you've had good leaders or helping you. I mean, it's stressful for me when I see a project going off the rails, as I call it, right? Sort of you sort of smell that something's not going right, you know? How do you sort of get that team sort of back on track? I'm not a fan of like get everyone in the room together and like hash it out. Like I think, I think that ends up becoming like a free for all and people start ripping into things. I, this, and I've learned this over time. I think it's better off have the one-on-ones with everyone. Like, 
set a clear vision of why do you think it's off the rails, how do you think it would be brought back on the rails. Meet individually or one-on-one, -on -one, then either you or assign someone to make a proposal of how we get this back on track, then get everyone in the room. Because I think if you just get everyone in the room and say, hey, it's off the rails, like, that can become, you know, and there is like, there's a book, uh, Google Sprint, which is a, a really great book, I recommend it. And when you're starting off on like a new project, it's nice to just, everyone just brainstorm and throw stuff on a wall. But I think if you've down the road a little bit and you have a product and you have an established market and you're, you're doing you know, work that's got real kind of implications on the business side, I don't advise just you know, the free for all. Well, that was helpful. You mentioned that you started uh, as a QA engineer and, and and um, you know, your first action was to give a list of all the bugs you found. I find that relatable in the sense where, coming from a technical background, you may tend to zoom in to the details. And I, I guess in your career, maybe at one point, you, you learn to step back in some of the detailed things and, and maybe uh, um, somehow manage to constantly keep the big picture in, in mind so you can share that with people. So looking back to that learning process, if you could give some uh, advice or shortcuts, you know, to when to step back and when to actually zoom in, what would you comment? Yeah, I, I think um, Nokia did this awesome thing where they did consumer focus groups, and they had the budget to do it, which was nice too. But I think you, you don't you can do it low budget too. But it was you know sitting be behind double sided glass, and then there was a moderator who didn't work for our company and then you know, have people use the product and then having them, watching them use it and hearing, them use, you know, hearing the comments that they had, that was just, to me, an awe-inspiring moment in my career that really reinforced, it's, you know, you have to look at the forest through the trees type thing. Um, so I think my advice on that is make sure your user community, you're, you're being honest and asking them like, how are we doing? Is this working for you? So do the one-on-one -on -one usability tests, do the small focus group tests, but don't ask the leading questions. You know, like try to ask questions and find out from them, are they getting value from what you're building? Um, and sometimes that gets, for me, it gets hard to do, especially in the beginning it's easy because you haven't really built anything or you're not invested. The more you actually work on it and you put your blood, sweat, and tears on it, the harder you'll find it internally to ask the question, something like, hey, what do you think of this product? Because it's like, it's yours, it's your baby, you're, gonna, it's, you're just naturally gonna feel bad if they say bad things about it. So see, can, how can you get maybe an independent person who's not as involved in it, who can ask those honest questions, and then try to digest that feedback that you're getting? And I think if you're doing that, as well as, you know, depends on the product, but look at the bottom line, like, are, is it successful? Are you making money, or are you, uh, you know, philanthropically making the world better? Like, I mean, I think that's, you know, really asking your your users and your customers if they're getting value. Okay. I'm looking to hire a product manager, management person. Um, what are some of the questions you would ask, or what are some key things you would look for that would make an excellent product? I think, there... tactically speaking, if you have a a product at your own company or products in the genre, like ask them, you know, or you could even ask them what, if, it's, if you're a tech company, like what tech products in your life do you really like and how could they be better? I think the how could you make it better? How could it be better? And that will help you get insight into their thought process. Um, and then in terms of the strategic and personal, ask those teamwork questions. Like when you're interviewing them, is it all about them or is it about their team? Um, I think the team approach is pretty important. And then, and then to the question that was just asked, are they big picture thinkers? Or are they just, you know, do they just drill in? Um, and I think understanding the business value is super important of why, why are you spending R&D budget and why do you, you know, what's going to be the impact of you putting effort into this particular um, initiative and what's going to be good for the for our what's going to be good for our customers what's going to be good for our company in doing so go ahead um, do you have any advice on like uh, I work with some teams and sometimes like product managers leave or like uh, like what's your advice on like how to handle like transitions like because I think that's usually a big challenge for us 
I think you, you have to handle the transition before it occurs. Okay. Like, I just had a, I mean, on a personal side, right? I just had a, I've been trying to look into, our, our finance team is doing invoicing in a pretty antiquated manner, right? So when I first joined this new company, I've, I've been very customer focused. I haven't really looked at our back-end operational stuff, but we've got some of the customer stuff going. So I started looking at the back-end operational stuff. And we have a finance person, she's a part-timer, but she's doing all the invoicing for our company. And there are incredible amounts of these crazy circumstances of one customer wants to pay, pay a big amount up front and then do little projects and you know, do partial invoices and percentages. And she does all these crazy steps and she hasn't documented anything. She hasn't documented a single thing. So if she takes two weeks vacation, I don't think we can invoice customers. And that's like not good. So I think the step on the transition piece is, and in product, like people should be, as a manager of product managers, make sure they're documenting how, you know, the high level, like, you know, the bugs, the feature ideas, the roadmap plans, like all that stuff should be accessible and reviewable and not just sit on their hard drive somewhere. Um, and the other thing I think you can do is, uh, from a manager's standpoint, my wife is a, she's an organizational psych psychologist. She does, uh, she works for Pitney Bowes and, and HR. So she's always talking about succession planning. So in your mind, like, you should always think, okay, if this person leaves, who's going to backfill and get that person that experience? So if you have assistant product managers or a developer who wants to see what it's like to be a product manager or a customer support person, have your product managers give them some features to go out and design or give them some requirements to write, things like that. Um, and that brings a question on requirements. That's another one. See how they ask them to write a couple of sample requirements. See what the requirements, are they clear are they, or are they ambiguous? Are they digestible or are they verbose and you can't follow them? Are they testable? So things, that's another test. It is incredibly difficult to manage up. Um, I've failed at it so many times, oh my goodness. Because when you tell, it's so hard to, especially at startups, like when you're telling the boss that they could do a better job at something, like that's really hard feedback to give to someone who's you know, on the organizational hierarchy up above. Um, I think if you can find peers and you guys can kind of make proposals um, that can be helpful for sometimes upper level management when they feel, oh, it's not just one person telling me I should do a better job at something or I should make different decisions, but it's, it's really, oh, my wider team. The other thing I would say is, and I've made this, again, horrible mistakes, but I'll see something that's wrong and I'll say, this is wrong, we should fix it, this is terrible. If you just flip that and say, here's an opportunity for improvement, without bashing it, that's so much better. And you'll just see, like if you're talking to, like for me, my CEO, like I, sometimes I get carried away, I get passionate, I'm like, hey, this invoicing thing, it's a mess, we gotta make it better. Like I learned from that, I didn't go to him and say, our invoicing is a total disaster. I said, hey, I, by the way, I checked out our invoicing and I think there are areas that can really be improved and if we don't improve it, I, I foresee this really bad situation that could happen to us. So you're not like chicken little, sky is falling, screaming at them, telling them, you know, I'm smarter than you, you could do a better job. You're kind of giving them just that opportunity that you don't have to hold them over the coals. You're, you're actually bailing them out as opposed to telling them everything they're doing is wrong. Is that helpful? Yeah. Um, based on your experience, what kind of recommendations do you have in terms of how to get, say you have a product launch, right? And uh, it didn't go so great. Um, what kind of methodology in terms of holding like a retroactive to get feedback for the next time so you don't repeat the same mistakes? And then how do you motivate uh, people after a failure to you know, get them to still stick around after everyone's just got pummeled and you know, how do you yeah. motivate them as a, as a coach? Um, first of all, I don't think you can BS them. So definitely do not, do not just you know, call out this, you know, everything's gonna be better. Like, I think that will, cause they're just gonna ask why. So I think step away and, and look for the real silver linings and look for the, the things that 
so yeah, some things went wrong, but what went well, right? So don't only focus on the things that went wrong. And then kind of back to the, some of the same answer I gave before, like have your one-on-ones with the, with the stakeholders of why they think it failed. Like give, them, give everyone an opportunity to voice it to you in a safe way where if, if you have that group meeting, someone's not gonna say, hey, like, you know, this was what really, really went wrong because they might, they might not feel comfortable doing that. So give them a safe environment to be honest with you um, and then protect them. So even if you found out, oh, it was uh, Sally's fault, Sally like really dropped the ball, don't kill her. Like give her a chance, as long as it wasn't like her third time, fourth time doing it, like give her a chance to redeem herself and look for the things that went well that you could further enhance and then after you have those one-on-ones, together as a team, it's not one person solving it. How can you then solve it as a team? And I think, I think then you'll have the loyalty. That'll build the loyalty and the trust of your team that the next time, you know, and there's no guarantees. The next time, look, you might be on the wrong product and maybe, or maybe the market changed. And you might, no matter how good of an emotional leader you are, no matter how good of a team leader you are, no matter how good of a programmer and a designer you are, it might still not work. And then think about how are you going to handle that? And again, like, you know, it's, that's when they talk about pivoting in startups. And, and then it's time, I think, to, to pivot. And how do you do that as a team without making everyone feel horrible about it, but like get them excited and engaged? Yeah, how to judge the team's empathy? Like uh, how they are, like, uh, what's the way? Why, why I'm having this question is now like sometimes the teams are not working at one place, they work at different locations. So like uh, judging people are like how to come up with like what's their empathy level, like how they have to work. Um, judging is a tough question. I, I would look at it introspectively as the product person, which is are you telling the stories that allow them to empathize? So as the product lead, it's up to you to explain to them, okay, here's what the customer experience is right now. Um, so I think, I think there it's not necessarily judging them, but judging yourself. Are you, are you painting a good enough story that they can comprehend it? And the other thing I think is eating your own dog food. So help someone, and I don't do enough of this either, but like, let's say I have a, a project manager who's not, I feel like not empathizing for a particular situation and, and they've never gone through it themselves. So I'll get on the phone with them and do a screen share, like a Zoom meeting or something, and I'll say, listen, I want you to pretend you're this person. Pretend you're this customer, you have this issue. Let's together go through the screen share experience, and I show them. I can do the same thing with developers. I do that all the time. Like some develop I have a, you know, developers will say, ah, that's just, you know, who cares that the tech shows up over there? Like, what's that a big deal for? But then if you show them to it, and walk, like, look how frustrating this is to them. Oh, they gotta go to this page and this page, back to that page. Then all of a sudden they, they get it. So can I, if I judged him on, on, or, or her on how empathetic they were, they would have failed. But it was really me who failed because I didn't give them an opportunity to really feel it. So that would be my advice there. I worked for a, a guy at Nokia who did not believe in consensus at all. He was like the dictator. Um, and he was the one who also felt that um, essentially uh, no carriers would ever take the iPhone and or Android devices. So that didn't really work out so well from his auto, you know, autocratic or, or dictator, di dictator type approach, right? But then I've also been part of, of meetings, even at my current company, where we try to design by committee and it's all these ideas and amazing ideas and they're great ideas, but then after the meeting, everyone walks out and no one has action items and no one has, and nothing comes from it. Um, like everything in life, I think it's about finding middle of the road. Um, again, I mean, this keeps coming back. So again, I'll give the same advice. It's have the one-on-ones before you have the meeting. Um, and as product person, like it's okay to say, hey, you just gave me great feedback and I did take that into consideration, but hey, I had to make a call. And I had to make a call. And I think if you give people the chance to give their feedback and you kind of explain to them, I'm, I'm also not one, there's a cliche, I should have had it up cliche, there's no such thing as a bad idea. I completely agree with that. There's a lot of bad ideas out there. A lot of bad ideas. Um, but even if someone gives you a bad idea, maybe you know if they didn't do it maliciously, obviously, 
give them feedback that explains you know, why from a business standpoint it doesn't make sense right now. Maybe they'll actually be able to talk you out of it and talk you into something, but have that trust that anyone on your team could have the next great idea, but ha it's hard to have those in these like group consensus meetings. So have the one-on-ones, which slows you down. As a product person, it's gonna slow you down, but you're gonna build that trust and loyalty because the worst thing to have is that someone feels like their opinion doesn't count or their voice doesn't count, then they have this great idea but they're afraid to, like, they're afraid to voice it because they're afraid they're gonna get shot down or something and then you miss out on that. Um, but I think if you, if you do that, then when you explain to them, hey listen, we might be able to get to your idea at a later sprint, then they'll, they'll get on the, they'll get on the same, on the same team, you know, on the same sort of, on the same path. Yes, sir. You do have to lay down the law. How do you do it? Uh, I'm a big fan of prioritization. So um, I, I do really like that about Agile. So there's 10 things you need to get done. Don't just like drop the 10 things. You know, you can, if you can serially list them, that's helpful to folks. I think if you've done all the other things we talked about, you've gotten the team sort of all in the same direction because you've explained the business side, you've explained the stories to them. Um, then I think they all understand the priorities. And if you've, if you've established the one-on-one -on -one relationships and you've established the trust, then hopefully it won't ever get to a point where you're having to like kind of bark out orders irrespective of fire drills that sometimes that is required in a fire drill. Like, hey, I don't have time to debate. This is what we need to do. Let's go do it. And in that case, listen, you've built up the trust. They know you're the product person. Like, they know it's on you. If it's successful, they're going to get credit, but if it fails, they don't have to worry about being held accountable because you're going to take that for them. And I think if you're that shield for them, they're going to, you're going to have team members who are going to go that extra mile for you. And, and I don't think it'll ever have to come to having to like, you know, stomp your feet or anything. If you have a top level, like an individual team member, how can you use emotional intelligence to kind of handle that person? Um, you know, walk a mile in their shoes, try to think about where they're coming from, uh, try to have a safe conversation with them, and, and understand you know, where your differences are. Um, maybe engage with, a, with HR or with a third party to see if they can help out with that. I think it's all about, um, so if I, you know, I think you, you always take your personal life and your career life, so, so in marriage, or I've been with my you know, wife 15 years or so, and I, when we were first together, and if we had a, you know, an argument or a problem, I'd always say, well, what do I need to do to fix it? What do I need to do to fix it? And what she always would say to me, and I still haven't always learned it, but what she always say to me, I just want you to listen. I just want you to listen. Don't try to solve it right away. Just listen, let me vent, let me explain where I'm coming from then let's go solve it. But don't just immediately try to solve my problem.